John Hubbard from Cornell and the University of Marseille. He will talk about parabolic flow ups in dynamics and, hyper and hyperbolic geometry. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And it's always a pleasure to be back in Stony Brook. It's beautiful weather and so forth. And uh, let me begin by making a suggestion for your next elementary calculus class. So my suggestion is the following. Look at the following now. F sub n is equal to 1 minus a over n squared e to the 2 pi i over n z minus n plus a, which I hope you will recognize as a polynomial of degree 1. I can't see it. I <laughs> <laughs> it's a better job. Um, Better chalk. I'm afraid. Oh, I'm afraid that's right. your fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what is what's special about this map? You want me to tell it to you again? No, no. It's one plus a over m squared e to the two pi i over m z minus m plus m. It's a it's a polynomial of degree one. Right. F of Z is something times Z. This this side is better than Okay. Okay, I'll write it again. John, use this. Yes, this is <laughs> and I invite you to, to observe the two following things. These are good things for first year calculus. Limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n of z is equal to z plus 2 pi. Limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n of z iterated n times, which is still a first degree polynomial, is equal to z plus n. And the point about this is that if you look at the group generated by the single generator f n, the limit of these groups is not a group with a single generator. It's a group with two generators. This is one of the this is the fundamental mechanism that leads to enrichment of dynamics. How by taking higher and higher iterates, you can somehow make the high iterates converge to something which is not part of the original dynamical system, even though uh, and it already occurs in an example as, as, as straightforward as it. By the way, this is really, it is really true that this is something that you can easily assign as an exercise in the second term of first year calculus. Now, what does it mean to say uh, the limit of these groups is equal to the group generated by z max to z plus two pi z plus two pi i and z plus n? Uh, the limit of these one generator groups is a two generator group. Now, in what sense does that limit make sense? Fortunately, in the world of, uh, of Kleinian groups, it's quite easy to really make sense of. It's, I, as I'm planning to make a parallelism between the situation of Kleinian groups and the situation of, uh, of, poly, of iteration of polynomials or rational functions, <coughs> it's much easier to do it in the world of Kleinian groups. I would like to remind everybody that if you have a compact metric space, if A is a compact metric space, then 
Then the set of closed subsets of A. Closed subsets of A. Is also a metric space. In fact, it's also a compact metric space. With the Hausdorff metric, and the Hausdorff metric sets it as a distance, the distance between uh, x1 and x2, for x1 and x2 closed, sub closed subsets of k. The distance between x1 and x2 is the inf of the uh, epsilon such that x2 is in the epsilon neighborhood of x1 and x1 is in the epsilon neighborhood of x2. And although it isn't quite, it isn't quite uh, first year calculus uh, uh, mathematics, it is a standard exercise in concept topology that this is a metric, that, it is, that the uh, set of clo close subspace spaces do form a compact set and so forth. Now, if I take G of E group, the group I really have in mind is SL2C, or perhaps PSL2C. But uh, other cases are interesting also. Then you can look at uh, when g bar is equal to the one point compact solution. Of G, which is still a metric space where, where you have a new group, probably all of this goes through for a locally compact group also. And then you can look at the space of closed subgroups. H is G, but you're really going to look at H union infinity as a compact subset of G union infinity, the one point compactification of G. And this does make the space of closed subgroups of any new group into a compact metric space in its own. And the Hausdorff limit is still a group. What? Yes, the Hausdorff limit. The Hausdorff limit of any group is a group union infinity, the way I've defined. This topology is called the, Sh the Shabuki topology. There's no A. The Shabuki topology. On the space of closed subgroups. Uh, and it's with respect to that topology that this limit of groups is then of one generator groups is that two generator. Now, it may be true that it is a first year first course topology exercise to, to, to study this compact method, the, this, the Hausdorff topology on the space of closed subgroups, but you shouldn't think that it's completely innocent. Uh, this compact metric space is some huge infinite dimensional metric space, and trying to really understand what it is is a major undertaking in its own right. And uh, people like Jim West have proved that it is, in fact, a Hilbert cube. So this thing here is, in fact, a Hilbert cube. And this is a subset of a Hilbert cube. And I guess the question that I'm really going to be addressing is what? The Hilbert cube means a countable product of intervals? Yeah. The product quality. Yeah. A countable that's certainly a good way of defining it. What, what are they, I mean, it can be embedded in the cube. Uh, it's embedded in Hilbert space also. What is the space of those <coughs> subgroups? Or 
And I'm hoping for an answer that is better than just saying, it's a mess. I'm hoping for an answer that will tell me, oh, it's cohomology groups or such and such, they vanish above some dimension, and things of that sort. Here are the generators. Uh, I, I'd like to understand it in the sense of understanding a complicated metric space. You have lots of components, I guess. What? Has, you know, I don't really know. You have all these three manifolds. Yeah. You have all those three manifolds, and, and there are a lot of them. You have uh, two names for this topology. You have the topology and components of the topology. Now, what? Um, Thurston is the great explorer of this topology. Though he, he had a different view of it, which I will try to, try to tell you about in a moment. The insider's view rather than the outsider's view. This is the outsider's view. So the whole door topology is the same as topology. Excuse me? This whole door topology is just another name for topology. Yes. And it's also another name for the geometric topology. What? Well, or on the space on the quotients. Oh, um, now, I don't expect anybody in my life in my lifetime to say anything serious about this question. But uh, in the if you restrict to two generator subgroups as opposed to one generator subgroups, if you restrict to two generator subgroups and even more specifically to two generator subgroups whose commutator is parabolic. I do have serious hopes of actually telling you precisely what the topological space this is and computing its cohomology and uh, telling you what its dimension is and so forth and so on. It's still just hopes, but I'm going to try to modify what my vision of what the, of this space is in that case. Let me give you a couple of examples of what this space does. And there's one very example, important example that you should look up at early, which is to take G equals R. There is the simplest Lie group. And what is its space? What is this space? Uh, of uh, closed subgroups of R. Well, a closed subgroup of R, they come in three species. There are the, there's zero, there's all of R, and there's uh, the subgroups isomorphic to Z. So there's zero, there's R, and there's Z for some T is in say positive. But what is the what is the topology on this set? And it's important to realize that as T goes to zero, your group goes to all of R and not to zero. You can see that indeed, if you take a small t, the group tends to look very dense in R. And as t goes to zero, so you have R plus union zero, union infinity, but, z, but uh, union all of R. But this all of R is at zero. It's a closed interval. But uh, here you have the group R, and here you have T greater than zero, and here you have infinity. But the zero of T is close to the whole R, and the infinity of T is close to the group zero. Now, already if you go up to the second simplest Lie group, R2, if you take G equals R2, it's already a lot more mysterious what this group looks like, and I, what this space looks like. And I can tell you what it is, but it's not so we, it, it takes some doing to prove it. If you take G is equal to R2, 
There's a two sphere of, of subgroups which contain F0, the subgroups isomorphic to Z, which form a cone, just by where the degenerator is, actually plus or minus the generator. Then there are the subgroups isomorphic to R, forming the real projective line. Then there are the subgroups isomorphic to R cross Z. And then there is the subgroup R2. But of course, this is omitting most of the subgroups. Most of the subgroups are discrete groups isomorphic to Z2. And how do they sit? Well, the answer is the set of all of these subgroups is isomorphic to the four sphere. And this two sphere is embedded in that four sphere as a suspension over the triforum dot. Uh, this is a suspension over that circle, over the circle. And that circle is embedded in the, in the three sphere as a four sphere, as a triforum dot. And then you have the uh, suspension in both directions. So already there, the topology is less obvious than you might think. And if you go up one further dimension, uh, this is the situation of R2. For R3, as far as I know, nobody really understands what the, what, what the space of those subgroups of R3 looks like. Uh, uh, it's not a manifold. It's some nine-dimensional uh, cell complex. And who knows what it looks like? So for R for R two, where, where does the three come from to give you the, the triple knot? It really comes from the discriminant of uh, of elliptic curves. The PC four P squared to minus twenty seven P cubed equals zero. You see the, the subgroup isomorphic to Z two are lattices. And lattices, well, the, the, you can do some complex analysis and start talking about the Eisenstein series E2 and E3. And, but then you only have a lattice if those two, uh, if those two Eisenstein series, which come in at the, uh, there's a theorem which says that, uh, C over, um, C over gamma is equal to, uh, the curve y squared is equal to x4, x cubed minus uh, g2, x minus g3, where g2 is up to a factor of 140 or something, the sum of 1 over uh, gamma to the fourth, uh, gamma and gamma, and g3 is equal to the sum, and that's a different from minus 0, and uh, gamma minus of 1 over gamma to the 6. And so these, these two functions, which are functions of, get, of the lattice, uh, in order to be a lattice, you have to have um, the knot be in the, the discriminant of this cubic local, of this cubic polynomial is not allowed to be 0. And that gives you a, a G cube uh, G cubed is different from G uh, three squared. There might be a four or twenty seven in there someplace, um, and uh, if that's where the and this is well known. If you intersect that curve with the three sphere in C two, you get triforum. We have a sculpture out here that illustrates some of this. Uh, uh, okay, to you. okay, so that's where the two and the three are. The, 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 that's where the triforum map is coming from. Okay, that's not really what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is what is the shuttle D topology. Turns out to be convenient to know 
analyze it and treat it other than one. So I'm saying that it's parabolic, and I'm saying it's this particular parabolic. The space of these groups is, well, the space of two generator groups is obviously a space of dimension six, since PSL2C has dimension three, and you just take two generators. You take this equation, and complex dimension six. What? Complex. complex dimension six. You take this equation, well, that's a matrix equation, so it's really three equations, and it brings the dimension down to three. There really are independent equations. It's not too hard to check. Even then, you're allowed one more normalization because the translations, uh, uh, you, you're still allowed the, uh, to, to normalize by translation. And you can put some fixed points in an element like A at C. And that's one complex, thing, one complex equation. So this space up to normalization. Well, I'm about to show you what the, what they what the discrete ones look like, because there's a marvelous program, too little known, called Opti, that was written by uh, a man called Wada, and it's supposed to be running. It is, and maybe I'll quit from it and start it up. Again. Okay, so the picture that you see here is a one complex dimensional slice through this two dimensional space of groups. And I can change the slice if you want. This slice is especially nice, but there are plenty of other slices. The colored locus is the discrete groups. The what? The discrete groups. In this, one, in this one dimensional slice, the colored, the colored locus is the discrete groups. In any color. Any color. The black is the non discrete groups. How about white? Uh, well, <laughs> this funny shaped thing is definitely. The, uh, the space of discrete groups in that particular slice. And I can change the slice. It, it's sort of surprising for the first time. Anyway, it's, it's, it's discrete groups sitting inside the uh, fractal curve there? Yeah. Okay, that's what you're saying? Those are everything strictly inside. Everything strictly inside are actually uh, discrete faithful representations of discrete group on two generators. And then on the boundary, on the boundary, Boundary life is more constant. They're still discrete. They're still discrete because the discrete groups form a closed set. What is the dot in the center? Excuse me? What is the dot in the center? Uh, so right here, you have four shear groups, in, and these two points actually do not exist. Those two points do not actually correspond to, uh, to groups. The, uh, so that something is going wrong. And the center, well, what do I do? You are the center. I'm about to put the dots on my sets. But before I do that, let me bring up, this is the limit set. But let's go over and put the dots on my sets.
So you are now seeing the group corresponding to that red dot being drawn. Now what does being drawn mean? The computer is computing the limit set of that group. That group is a quasi Fuchsian group. There is a simple closed curve, as you can see in the, the black, which does subdivides the plane into two parts. And um, all these circles that you see drawn are part of the proof that that particular group is actually uh, is actually discrete. Because this picture comes with a proof that the black dots correspond to indiscrete groups and the colored dots correspond to uh, discrete groups. Now, this is actually true, but there are some dots that you probably can't see from where you are, such as, for instance, this gray dot here, and that gray dot there, and there are a few more of them, because there are a few, a few non-discrete groups a few discrete groups hidden in the black, uh, where the, the, the representation is still discrete, but not, uh, but not free, not faithful. So rigid groups, yes. What? Well, there's some kind of rigid groups. They're rigid groups. Well, actually, no, they're not rigid. They, but they form one parameter slice. Oh, the rigid two parameters slice. Yeah. They're rigid in the Yeah, they're rigid in the slice. Yeah, the rigid in the slice. That's true enough. <laughs> Okay, now I want to exhibit that this phenomenon really occurs in this picture. In order to do that, let me make a nice big blow up. It takes a little while to get the picture to be really nice. And maybe I'll even make another blow. Maybe you can see more of those gray dots. Maybe I'll even do another blow. And after these two blow ups, two points of this picture correspond very nearly to the same group. Now here is. Let's try. There are more of those gray dots. You start seeing more of them as you go in further and further. Here is a. You see, see that limit set? Here is practically the same. Here is practically the same. Well, let me let me go back to the previous one and show you what has happened. That group is in the pink. Um, so the group that you see at the moment corresponds to this red dot right there, which is indeed in the pink. Uh, not by much. But it is indeed in the pink. But you'll notice that its limit set looks really quite different from the way the limit set looked for this one. Is it still a simple, simple curve? Excuse me? Is it still a simple curve? Well, uh, da 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 da. Uh, so the answer is it is still a simple closed curve. But if I were in the limit that I would like to be in, it would not. If I were in the limit that I would like to be in, what that limit set would look like. What? Okay. <laughs> I don't have a program that will actually draw the limit. But I. The limit ought to look like this, and should not be a simple closed curve. 
Does he have to be on value of the set? Uh, no, actually, it isn't just that it would need to be on the value of the set. It would have to be right there, right at that place where I am going to look and see, it and see something which isn't a simple closed curve either. It would have to be right where the parabolic is. But the point is that this one is close to a parabolic which contains one of my fn's, but also contains my fn to the nth. It has, that group of cars contains an element like this, but since it contains an element like this, it also contains an element like that. And so it's very, it very nearly has a two-generator uh, parabolic subgroup, rather than just a one parabolic subgroup, which is, which is what you get if you go to this point. So John, what do you mean it contains the second thing in the limit? What I mean is that it is a group which contains a hyperbolic element like this. It contains an element with two discrete fixed points. In this case, the two fixed points are at infinity and at f. But of course, as n goes to infinity and n goes to infinity, so the two parabolic points, the two fixed points, are very close. Now, my claim is that it is really true that the, the groups that are over here have containing elements that are very much like this FM. They have lots of rotation. And as a result, you can almost see, and I'm going to show you where they are, this element and that element. And they vary near the limits of these groups if you approach this point the right way. The limit of those groups, if you approach them the right way, is very nearly a group with an extra generator. Well, the limit will be a group with an extra generator. So let's take a group which is almost that group. This one. So I haven't quite been able to get this picture. It hasn't quite closed down at that point, but it's very close. There's a parabolic, well, no, there's a hyperbolic element in this group, but this hyperbolic element has its fixed points here and there. If you are somebody who thinks three-dimensionally, three you will think that this is the plane of infinity of hyperbolic space. The, the axis of this hyperbolic goes from here, comes up in a semicircle, and goes there. And the original parabolic element that we were thinking about is the one that goes, is the one that takes this point to that point. But there's some large iterate, which consists of going all the way around, well actually, going all the way around, maybe I'll go this way, and which consists, so that you have a translation that way, but in the group, you very nearly have a translation this way also. In other words, you very nearly have in your group an element like this and an element like that. In the limit groups, you actually, if you take, so let's see what's going on. What's, what happened in in the dynamical space, in the parameter space, at that point. Some word in AB, and as it turns out, it is AB for this particular cusp, which is just about the simplest cusp. Some word has become parabolic. And this region is parametrized by the trace of AB. The trace of AB. Excuse me, you're assuming one commentator is parabolic. Some other word is also parabolic. Some other word, uh, through a, uh, for all values of this picture, the commutator of A and B is always parabolic. Because yeah, other generators are getting almost parabolic. But you have an equation for every word in the for every word in the group, you have an equation saying that the trace of that word is plus or minus 2. That's for the condition for being parabolic. For every word, you have such an equation. 
and those correspond to these cusps, and then all those cusps, and then all those cusps, and all those cusps, and so forth. All of those correspond to more or less complicated words becoming a, having traits too in the representation. Ah, now that's a complicated question because at this point, ask that question again and tell me when exactly you want to know what happens to the three dimensional map. Ask the question again. Your question was, what happens to the three dimensional map? Hyperbolic map is linear to count parabolic map, so what can happen to the average domain? It depends how you approach that point. It depends how you approach it. Uh, there is no limit to the manifold at that point. The manifold has infinitely many limits, and precisely the object of this lecture is to describe what that set of limits looks like. Do you like that answer? I mean, the, the point is that, you see, there are lots of possible A's. And depending on how you approach this point, depending on how you approach it, if you approach it like that, then you will approach unenriched dynamics. The no power of Fn will actually, no power of Fn will have a limit. Well, no high, as the powers go to infinity, the, the element of the will just go to infinity in psl 2 c But if you approach it, if you approach it, this is the trace of a stack plane. If you approach it like this, along any path that is quadratically tangent. So this is trace, this is the trace, this is two, this is trace of AB, here is zero, here is two. There are other interesting points along here, this is all black. But if you approach this along a path which is tangent to the real axis and staying outside the black, you definitely will get an enriched structure. You definitely will get that the appropriate limit of your generator will, will exist and be in the Shabuki limit of the, of the groups, even though it is not an element of the group itself. The group is going to have more generators than it has. So at this point, there's, there's not just one limit, there's a whole bunch of and my objective is to try to describe that whole bunch of limits. In terms of what's happening to the quotient manifold? In terms of what? Well, in terms of what happens to the quotient manifold, in terms of what happens in the Shabuki topology, in terms of the closure in the space of compact subsets of the sphere of the set of limit sets, uh, all of those are reasonable questions. Now, to motivate the answer, I'd like to change gears for a second and switch to polynomials. knows, and everybody ought to know, <laughs> this picture, which Greenwich, covered, Greenwich Village, man, this picture. Excuse me? Greenwich and Greenwich Village know this picture. I was scribbling at a cafe at the end of the Oh, the man was there. <laughs> so everybody ought to know that picture. It is the picture in parameter space, uh, the black <coughs> KC is equal to the set of C such that E sub C can be at n times of C does not go to infinity. And M, the black 
like so. Is the set of C such that case of C is connected? There's a dichotomy that says that either case of C is connected or it is a header set, and N is the locus where it is. I, maybe I, I really don't want to spend much time with this, but maybe I'll just give you one example of a counter set. Let's choose any colored point, such as, for instance, this one. That set is a counter set. Uh, you can see that it clearly forms two pieces. But, a lot of components. Well, a lot of compo components. And which part of that is what you call that set? If I blow it up again, there it is. And you can see that it comes in lots of components. If I blow it up again, there it is. And you can see there are lots of components. I blow it up again. You never find anything connected in there. But you never find an isolated point. It's a compact set without isolated points. So, so it's a pair set. Whereas, if I choose some reasonably complicated uh, point, oh, I don't know, something like this, this thing is connected. Okay. Zoom in a little bit. Where? Here? Yeah, anywhere. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Any further than me that you would like? <laughs> I'll be glad to provide. It's getting uh, thicker. Provide. It's getting thicker. It's thicker. What? It's getting thicker. Well, I, I, I'm now perhaps not quite at the scale where, the, where this thing would cover the, the, the solar system, but I can easily get down to that scale. And you have to expect that the computers uh, sort of get have trouble once you get beyond the resolution of their uh, of their floating point numbers. Okay. Now there is also parabolic trouble. There is parabolic trouble at this point. This time I will have a harder time explaining what I mean by enriched dynamics, but I will explain it to some extent. But here is a different way of asking that. Supposing I look at the set of all cases C, 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 compact subsets of C for the house door topology. Is the closure of the set of a case of C to the household topology. It is important to realize the case of C does not depend continuously on C. Does not what? Does not depend continuously on C. That there are many possible limits at some point. And therefore, the, the question of knowing what this closure actually looks like is a serious question. And in some sense, I'm hoping to answer that, although the answer is pretty complicated. And I think I have here a move. There it is. And here I am moving. Maybe I'll include my film. Let me see. Will this work? Uh, yes. So I have to move it up like that and move this over like that. And move this up a little bit further. There. So here you're seeing where I'm going to move the point. <laughs> 
in parameter space. You move the I'm C. Gonna move, you move the C, right? I'm going to move the C, and specifically, I'm going to move the C along that white line you see there. And here is what happens to the case of C. And maybe you don't see anything happening, but in a moment you will. By the way, this movie was computed in the 10 minutes before the talk. Just in case you're wondering whether this is a major undertaking, it is not. Now, what am I hoping that you're going to see? What I'm hoping you're going to see is a spiral. I'm hoping you're going to see, in this space of compact subsets, in the big infinite dimensional subset space of compact subsets of C, what I hope you're going to see is something like this. The curve spiraling down to a particular point. This is my white line, and it's my white line sitting inside this house with this uh, space of complex subsets of C for the house of knowledge. Now, what is it that you're supposed to, how are you supposed to see this spiral? The answer is, you're supposed to look at that little decoration. That little decoration is going to turn, and it's going to turn, and it's going to turn, and here it is turning. rather slowly. Maybe I'll make it turn faster. Okay, now we can see it turning. And every time, every now and again, this decoration has moved over to that one, but then that one has moved over to that one, and you're getting closer and closer to a specific limit. Even though the specific limit does not exist is not a Julia set of anything. Now, what has actually happened? It's very much my, like my Fn having some limit, and my Fn iterating n times having some limit. You have these Julia sets, which look like this. And this region, which I've been called, for obvious reasons, going through the egg beater. You start over here, you iterate. <laughs> and eventually you get over there. In the limit, as this is squeezed down, you no longer can go from here to here. But still, in the limit, there is a limit, of, there's an infinity of the iterate of your polynomial, which is a well-defined analytic map defined here and mapping there. Just as my limit of Fn iterated n times was not, of course, in the group, <coughs> as a map, it went on existing. At this point, you perfectly well can have a formula for that one. Um, oh yes, we know a lot about the nature of it, and I hate to tell you this, but the person who really discovered all this is Adam Hirschman, who was ex student, who wrote it all in his thesis. But you didn't read. That's all. I didn't have to. Yes, Adam Epstein is the person who really, well, well do, I mean, about that. do I mean the horse and so forth? It's a transcendental map of uh, a finite type, type map, map, right? But it's a transcendental map of finite type, uh, and we understand a lot about its dynamics. Okay, so now I'm going to try to make a picture. Here is the metal of the set. I'm drawing sort of in perspective. Now, I'm going to do the following operation. I'm going to 
This is three dimensional. I'm going to add a croissant. The, uh, the real axis, that part, that white right line, is here. Conversion down to some limit set. This is the real axis. This is a drawing in, say, the set of cases uh, of compact subsets of C. And here is that real axis, that particular one right there. Except that drawn in the set of KCs, it forms a spiral that spirals down to some circles worth of compact sets, which are compact sets corresponding to enriched dynamics. This part of the boundary of the cardioid is going to start looking like this. And is also going to spiral down to a different circle. Do you have a continuous parameter in the enriched dynamics? Yes, you have a continuous parameter in the enriched dynamics. And, uh, and unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to tell you what it is. Unless, I mean, after all, what am I here for? But to explain whatever it is that I have. The, the, the people want to know. So maybe I should. What I would have drawn here is what I call the parabolic floor at the cusp of the Mandelbrot set. The cusp of the Mandelbrot set has been removed from the plane, and I have replaced it by a croissant, i.e. really a copy of C over Z with the point at infinity up high going to this point this way, and the point at infinity down low going to that point that way. Now other than that, I've just drawn it. The important thing is that this thing has a topology. That the approaches, the approaches that are called horocyclic to the cusp, they're the ones which enter every region like this. The ones that enter every region like that, however small, they all correspond to curves that just go to that point. But all the non horocyclic approaches, all those which stay outside of some fixed such region, go someplace else. They go to some place on the Poisson, they don't necessarily converge, in fact they surely don't. They call it a spiral in some wild way. Every curve like this spirals to a different curve around here. So this is the first parabolic floor of the plane at the curve at the cusp of the Mandelbrot set. With that topology. Okay, but now that there are problems. There are points along the boundary of the Mandelbrot set, points like these, you can see if I can get them, points like these, that point, and then this point, and then this point, and then this point, which converge to some particular point here. That point corresponds to a point where the original dynamics does not have, have a, an enriched, a parabolic point, but the enriched dynamics does. And so if you wish to understand the possible limits, you're going to have to perform another parabolic blow up at this point. In fact, you're going to have to pop to do parabolic blow ups at all the points. You're going to have to look at the projective limit of all systems of finitely many projective parabolic blow ups. And that is what this closure of the space of K sub C's looks like. It is a huge, infinite projective limit of parabolic blocks. So, just on the 
trust point of the mental process, so you're looking at all the different And you have to blow up all of those too. You have to blow up all the parabolic points everywhere. And you have to and you have to do it in some intelligent order so that it makes sense. Because if you do too many parabolic blow-ups at one point, then you'll have a space whose topology you don't understand anymore, and you won't be able to define it at the next level of parabolic blow up. So you have to, it's very much, for the algebraic geometers in the audience, it's very much like uh, the Max Nurther Manin uh, monster, where you, you do all blow ups, you blow up every point in the projective plane, but that isn't quite true. What you do is if you can look at all systems of finitely many projective blow ups in the, in the projective plane, and you obtain the Nurther monster which is some complicated object, but which is the natural domain for the chromatic Well, the natural domain, the natural parameter space for quadratic polynomials is this huge infinite flow up if you want to keep track of what they are actually as dynamical systems. Now, maybe I should try to say something slightly reassuring about this huge blow-up, because if you ask me, it's a terrifying space. You might wonder, what is the closure? What is the proper transform, in the sense of algebraic geometry, of the boundary of the cardinal? Well, believe it or not, that's a pretty civilized space. It's the space of all continued fractions, so all sequences of integers except that you have to allow the symbol infinity. And then you take, so you can have 3, 17, infinity, 1, 1, 1, infinity, infinity, uh, 17, 3, 4, 237, infinity, and so forth. You look at all such sequences, and you give them the following topology. A neighborhood of a particular sequence is all sequences out to 1 over epsilon, where all the entries coincide with the ones that you have, except that you allow yourself to replace infinity by any number bigger than 1 over epsilon. Okay, so that's the topology uh, that, that, uh, that that space has. And that's what... So, the numbers that don't include any infinities are just the original irrational points on the boundary of the calculus. They're just still there. And then there is those continued fractions where there aren't any infinities. And the number of infinities that you see in your sequence is the number of parabolic blow-ups you had to do to find that point. And uh, in particular, there can be infinitely many of these things corresponding to dynamics with infinitely many generators. Okay, I have 20 seconds left. And so I will draw the analog of this picture for, for climbing groups and leave it shut. There's an analogous cone, and the boundary of so here is the colored locus in my opti pictures. This point right here is the this point right here is that parabolic point that we had, and these are all the horocyclic approaches where you enter every horocyclic neighborhood. But if you enter non horocyclically, you're going to turn to points on this cone, where the points on this cone really correspond to that number A that was in the group. And that number A has to stay away from the purely imaginary numbers, because otherwise your groups are not going to be discrete. So what's going to happen is that the boundary coming one way is going to spiral off some, sort of, some something or other on the cone, and the 
the boundary coming the other way is going to spiral into exactly the same thing. There's no distinctions. Unlike here, where when you come this way, you spiral towards one circle, and you come like this, you spiral on the other side. Here, you're going to spiral towards the same curve. But those, those groups also have parabolics. They use the new parabolic. And uh, so you have to perform a blow up like that again, and a blow up like that again, and take the projective limit. But this time, the projective limit is a lot more complicated. I don't really understand it at all. Uh, uh, the, 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 these, the various blow ups that you get are not this short. The blow ups that you get from some other test folder here actually come out and touch, touch the, second, the, the second blow up someplace else. I don't understand that yet. So that's what I'm busily studying. And I think I will stop here. So I think Okay, so thank you, and let's see if there are any questions. So, the limit is going to be a group, is it going to be imaginary? You can, get, you can definitely, in the, limit, in the closure of the two generator subgroups or two parabolics, there's definitely are groups of infinite, discrete groups with infinitely many generators. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have some idea. You know, adding in these generators corresponds to drilling holes in the original, in the original two-dimensional map. And you drill a hole, and you drill another hole, and you drill another hole. But these things are all going to be linked and knotted, and God knows all what else they're going to be. And uh, the actual structure of what there is in there is. In, I mean, presumably you're looking at things like the complement of the white of continuum or something like that. There so you cut the problem down and then you track the road so that you have... I have cut the problem down. I went down to two generator okay. groups with, with, the, with, the, with parabolic generators. It's the smallest thing I can do. All right. <laughs> Unless you insist Perfect. that I go down to one generator. So what's and the then if one generator, my groups are going to be commutative, and much of the interest is going to be lost. But I have. I've cut it down to the very smallest okay, that okay. there is. <laughs> but what, uh, What's happening if you have one generator, one more for us? That's, that's an exciting thing in itself. Trying to understand the, the closure of the space of one generator, or subgroups, of, the, uh, of ESL2C for the Shabuki topology is an exciting topic in itself. It's, but it's not wild. Uh, it's not wild like this. It's some finite dimensional complex. And uh, the answer to that has been written down completely by uh, Harry Back and Lucien Clavier, and should be appearing sometime soon. I would be glad to have him send you the topic. It's pretty complicated. Yeah. It's pretty complicated, but it is it is describable. It's not uh, a there's nothing like this. Uh, but I mean, is it possible if one does to get an engineering generator? No, you can't get more jet more than two. You can't. In the discrete groups, mm -hmm. you can't get more than two generators. You see, the limit obviously has to be commutative. And there aren't any commutative mm -hmm. subgroups of PSL to see. I mean, after all, there are limits of commutative groups, they have to be commutative. And uh, limits of commutative discrete groups, they can't, as groups, be all that complicated. Mm -hmm. But there, you can get lots of limits that are not, uh, that are not discrete. And so just just like that uh, S4 mm -hmm. with, with the funny sphere in it, where you have lots of S4s with funny spheres in it, and so forth, only a six-dimensional rather than a four-dimensional, so forth and so forth. I have one more question, and then, can we go back to the white picture from that where you had uh, the white picture? You, you want me to go back to the white There's a white picture underneath all these colored things. Mm -hmm. well, uh, uh, this one is here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There. So at one point you said you could see the A. Is that, did I understand it correctly? Um, so the commutator, this AB is translated yeah, by A. Time. I it was the A. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, it's um, I, considering that one of your maps, <laughs> can you see that what I'm doing? Yes. One of your maps goes from here to here. 
<laughs> the other one goes from here to there. So if this one corresponds to addition of, to subtracting one just a lot, just about, the A is purely imaginary or almost. Okay, so any further questions? If not, let, let me make an announcement first and then wait. Uh, so there will be dinner and uh, Ramos will be in charge of that. So if you are interested, let him know and let's find the speaker again.